Hello, welcome back to my channel. I'm JC and today's video I'm going to be taking you through another masterclass experience this time with Judy Bloom. Um, chose this one because I'm getting ready to embark on trying to write middle grade for my nano project and I've never written middle grade before so who best to get advice from than the one and only Judy Bloom. So I did her master class. I am going to show you in a moment um, clips and things from her master class that um, that I little nuggets that I thought were important to share with you. Obviously, I'm not going to be able to show you the entire thing because you know I'm pretty sure master class frowns upon that. So I'm going to show you as much as I can. Um, I will give assessments on after certain classes not every single one this time i'll explain why at the other side of this video and yeah so without further ado i'm just gonna go ahead and cut to the master class and i'll be back after the video to summarize my overall thoughts of the master class what i got out of it pros and cons um yeah i'll be back I think the main point of kids' books is to show that things that happen to you also happen to other kids. It makes kids feel that they are normal. I thought I was weird for doing and thinking some things, but your books make me feel okay. To me, this is a class about um, being free. It's not as scary as you think, but you have to be willing to take that chance. Nobody could teach me to write, I can't teach you to write. But what I hope I can do in this masterclass is share with you what I've learned about writing over 50 years. The best advice I can give you if you're starting out or even if you're caught in the middle is um, don't give up and don't listen to anyone who tells you you can't write because the person who's saying that has no idea what's inside you. I'm Judy Bloom, and this is my master class. I always ask writers when I meet them, what were you like as a child? Because I'm so curious, you know, I was, um, I was very small, I was anxious, but I was also, I like to make people laugh, uh, tremendously curious and imaginative. And I think that's the big thing, you know, the imagination never stops. know where an idea is coming from. It certainly comes from your own life and experiences, but it also comes from everything out in the world, everything that you see, that you hear, that you read, something that someone tells you. Uh, just one little tiny something can spark a whole book. If you want to write, you're absolutely a people watcher. Because otherwise, why would you write? How do you invent characters? You see things. That's how. So it's really all about listening everywhere. Listen in the elevator. Listen on the street. Listen in restaurants. Listen wherever you are. Doctor's offices, supermarket, everywhere. Listen. You're going to hear things that are going to um, help you 
get an idea or a character. I think every fiction writer uses his or her own life. Why not? Um, but if it was just the truth of our lives, how boring would that be? It would get old really fast. The mood that you're in when you're writing a book will come into the book, I think, and be a mood of a book. Sometimes you are using your own personal feelings and experiences and emotions, and you don't even know it. You don't know it until after the fact. So in Judy Bloom's lesson, um, the second and third one, which are two parters, um, it's finding ideas part one and two. She talked about using your imagination to um, and observing everything, letting your imagination roam, especially when you're writing for children. You know, never such thing as too much imagination. She discussed kind of writing writing all of the ideas down. You know, sometimes we write things down, but we hold back the ideas that we think aren't any good. She discussed that she just writes everything down, whether it's good or bad, just everything pertaining to the project. If she has a thought, a piece of dialogue that pops into her head or a name, name of a street, name of a town, name of a city, just whatever it is, she has notebooks dedicated to each project. And they're just filled cover to cover with just scribblings and writings about everything. And so she's like, you know, some of it won't go in there. Some of it, you know, you can't put everything in there, but it's nice to have it down. It gives you a sense of the backstory of the characters and the story itself. So that even if it doesn't go into the book, you know it as the writer. And it helps you be more informed and better, as, you know, in terms of writing, especially when you're writing um, for children. I have this feeling that those of us who write or maybe work in any creative field, there is something about the way we were born, something about the way we were children that set us apart. We're not better, we're not worse. We're not really different, but this is something that we have inside us. If I were trying to get you to go back into your childhoods, uh, maybe I would start with school. Mm. And I would say, put yourself into your whatever grade. Put yourself into your third grade classroom. Who's your teacher? Who's sitting around you? What are you doing? You, you have to you have to make a real effort to do that to go back and to find those details no matter how long ago it was and how much things have changed and you know what if you can't really get there then absolutely go into schools ask if you can you know help out at a classroom where you're writing a book and you need to observe i know lots of people who do that I hated secrets when I was growing up, and I remember that. They were always keeping secrets from the children. Don't tell the children, don't tell the children, don't tell, tell them what, what, what. And what I made up in my head, in my stories, was usually much worse than what I would have learned had my parents told me the truth. Um, so I think there's that, you know, secrets that, that adults are keeping from children, uh, things that they think children don't understand that children actually do understand or want to understand. When I started to write and I got the first two books out of the way, then I knew that I wanted to write about kids on the cusp. I like the idea of the 11, 12 year old 
um, just on the edge, because somewhere around that age, you find out that your parents are real people. It's not just mom and dad who are there for you, who belong to you. They're real people. When I started to write for kids, I vowed I would never send the, the kids away to Aunt Becky's house or Granny so-and-so's house and not deal with parents. In those days, there were a lot of books that didn't deal with parents and kids. And I had no way I'm going to deal with the parents and the kids um, together in the same house if that's the way they live. I mean, most kids live with a parent and have to deal with that person, that person's moods, that person's likes and dislikes and uh, stresses and everything else. So it, their, lives are, their lives are complicated. And I wanted to deal with the rea that reality. Here's a rule that my great editor, Dick Jackson, once came up with when we were talking about this. And he said, if it doesn't advance the story or illuminate the character, it goes. But if it does, if it does advance the story, whether it's language or behavior, or it does illuminate the character, it belongs. And that's something that I think is any one of us can take with us and use. We all have to be very, very careful to be the kid when we're writing. So, of course, we're never, ever talking down to them. We're never, ever preaching. We're not an adult telling ch children a story about being a kid. No, no. We are that kid. That's where we are. We might know a lot more because we're adults, um, but we don't announce that. But we never, ever are an adult talking down to a child. I don't care if you're five years old. You're a real person. You have real feelings. Voice, I think, is equally important for younger readers and adult readers. Pace, I think, is essential in a book for young readers. I like energetic writing, and I like fast-paced writing, and I don't care what age I'm writing for, although I know that an adult audience will give me they say 100 pages, I'm not at all sure of that, that adult readers will give you 100 pages before they put your book down. Kids are not gonna do that. You've gotta hook them right away um, because they're not gonna give you 100 pages. And certainly when you're writing for a young audience, you want that first sentence to be like, wow, I really wanna know what this is about. Try to get them on that first page. So in lessons five and six, um, which are writing for younger readers, part one and part two, um, she talks about, uh, one of the first things she talks about is dealing with complications in younger books, books for younger children, um, how she always hated that a lot of young, young adult writers or middle grade writers would kind of censor their work or not put certain things that they think are that they think are too young or too above a child's head and she 
always hated that. She always hated that the, you know, that adults would keep certain complications from children thinking that they are not old enough to handle them or to hear them or whatever. So she liked to address the complicated issues, the things that no one else would talk about. And she always felt that it was good to be honest in your work. Um, because if you do honest work, then, you know, it will translate to the reader that way. Oh, she talked about putting the real life things in there, just making it in terms where children can understand them better. Um, she also talked about most of her kids' books were about wanting, wanting the children reading them or wanting them to feel normal, the kids in the book to feel normal, so that kids reading the book can feel normal. Um, when they're reading things that don't get discussed by adult the adults around them, but they're reading it so they they know that they're normal because, you know, this is not something. How do I put this? It's not abnormal for them to be thinking about certain things or wondering about certain things because, you know, it it's in this book. There there is an adult that's talking about this to kids. Oh, she said um to use your childhood. It sounds like it's obvious, but I suppose sometimes you might not want, if you had a painful childhood, you may not want to tap into that pain. But in, in her view, it's what makes the book more honest and more real. She also talked about writing for children as in, they're just, just, just human beings too. Not necessarily thinking of it as I have to write differently in this way because I'm writing for a kid but thinking of it in terms of children are human beings too you're just writing for another human being that happens to be younger um she did also speak about when just dealing with difficulties and difficult complicated situations if it's not a situation or complication that moves the story forward um then don't use it don't just use it just to throw a complication in or a conflict in if it doesn't push the story to the next direction or to in the direction that you're trying to go then toss it just get rid of it it's not worth putting it in there just to add conflict only add it if it's something that helps the story progress she's talking about the, the writing for children is um more of an energetic writing it's more of a fast-paced uh quick not, you know, because sometimes adult books can so, sometimes take a little while to get to the point. Um, not in a bad way. Not saying that it's not interesting, but with middle grade or young adult, you don't have that long to get to the point. You don't have that long to hold their interest so that they keep reading. You have to get there quickly because otherwise they'll put the book down. And so she was talking about the pace of the writing being a quicker, more energized pace and the voice being a, a energized voice that, that moves the story forward in a quicker way so that you can hold the child's attention that you're writing for. And I think that was it. Back. In going through the notebooks, I just pulled some pages from one of them because I really wanted you to see what goes into it. This doesn't mean you need to do it this way. Why, why would you? But this is what's worked for me for so many years. And this is just one example. And in this case, I thought that I knew the whole story. So in the notebooks, I, I don't know. I found how much I didn't know. And this is what it says. Oi, oh, I read what I have. I have next to nothing. I have to start from the beginning. Help! With a lot of exclamation points. It also says, who are these characters? This is a really important note for me because it means I read what I had and I didn't know the characters. And that was my job, to make you know the characters and care about the characters. So I had to dig deeper and deeper into who were these people because there was just an idea of them at the beginning not the reality of who are they really the reading what you have and finding out 
oh, I have next to nothing. What do I do? I go back. I go back to the beginning. And I try to go deeper, more layers, more complexity, more story. There's nothing more important than character when you're writing. And you know, I think if you ask any writer, no matter what that person writes, it's going to be the same thing because any book is about the characters more than plot or anything else. It's the characters that make the story work. Character is everything. Without character, there's nothing. So, you know, spend a lot of time with your characters and getting to know them. And the way that you get to know them can be different from the way I get to know them. But my way is they don't come alive until I write about them, until I put them down on paper. <laughs> You can't tell your readers how to feel. You don't ever want to do it. If I see a movie or read a book that tells me how to feel, no, I'm out of there. You know, I'm angry. I resent that. So there's a, there's a fine line, I guess, between telling and showing. It's because of what your character does. It's the action. It's the inner voice again. It's, it's putting your character into a situation and showing us the character, but not telling us, um, Jane just felt so angry that she threw something across the room. You, you don't ever have to say how your character feels. In fact, we don't want to say how our characters feel. We want them to show us how they feel. I mean, when you're developing characters, characters have emotions. And it's good to let that come out. Or to take it away. Take it away. And that's another way of dealing with it. You know, we don't want it to be, we don't want to be pounded over the head with it. We want to find it. We want to come to it ourselves as readers. A lot of my characters are outsiders, I guess. I've never thought about that, but looking back, um, I see that they are. It's interesting. It's interesting to write a character who, um, who's the outsider for one reason or another. Everything contributes to the voice of the character. Everything from mood to how they see the world to how they see their family and their friends, everything. So there's another exercise for us, you know, write down all of this. You won't know it all, I think, in the beginning, because as you write, you find out. You learn, and all of that contributes to the journey, to the inner voice, um, and to th ultimately to the success of your book. Um, in lesson number nine and ten, which are is creating memorable characters, part one and two, she talked about spending time with your characters um, and having them. She suggested a really interesting idea 
for getting to know your characters better, particularly when you're writing for children, have them write you a like, well, have your character, I guess, write a letter to yourself as that character. Have them write to you about what they're feeling, what's going on, and things like that, so you can get a sense of their voice and their the mannerisms in which they speak, the way they they talk, their thought process, their you know those certain details. And I thought that was interesting. And I don't know why I've never thought of doing that before with characters in adult books, but it's really particularly interesting for kids because sometimes when, when kids write to you, I mean kids want to talk to you. I think the problem is we adults sometimes don't want to listen because we're busy we're doing this we're doing that we have things to do they're not getting to the point quick enough so sometimes kids want your full attention they want you to sit down and just listen to them other thing she mentioned about creating um care memorable characters is to give them real details make them feel real um kind of make them come alive don't I don't know, make you feel like it's a real kid that you're talking to or talking about or creating a story about. Not not just a figment of your imagination, even though they are just figments of our imagination. But this is why I think she suggests writing the letter as the character because it kind of makes it more real because it, it, it does. And I think I'm going to do that for my middle grade series. I'm going to write a letter from London to me. Um... And I, I do know, especially in middle grade, in young adult books, um, they do, you do have to do, she talked about showing more than telling. And especially in younger grade books, you have to show more than tell, because again, it's that, that attention thing. You, you have to hold their attention, and you're not going to hold their attention by using a whole bunch of words. I'll be back next lesson. The one thing that's never changed is the way that I write dialogue or approach dialogue. Um, it's always been the same from the beginning because I think this uh, this ear that I have for dialogue, I think it's always been there. Uh, I've always, you know, I'm fascinated by putting people together and seeing what happens. And one of the things that happens when you put people together is they talk to each other. Writing dialogue is my greatest pleasure when it comes to writing. Dialogue helps you advance your story. Here's a scene, um, and here's dialogue in the scene. And it's advancing not only your story, but your characters, because through dialogue, you learn a lot about your characters. It's giving your characters knowledge that they might not have had. It's got to advance the story and or it's got to illuminate the characters. It can't just be there for no reason because it's fun. And I have to say that to myself all the time because dialogue is fun. What makes good dialogue is believable, realistic, um, the way people really talk, dialogue, and dialogue that's going somewhere. Uh, what makes bad dialogue is, I don't know, people, characters who talk in full sentences and never interrupt each other, and um, talk in some literary way that's not the way people talk to each other. And I like dialogue between more than two people. It's fun. And what you can do also, and what I like to do, is not necessarily say each time which character is speaking. Because if it's, if it's working, you can usually tell. Especially if it's only two characters. You can't necessarily if it's three. But if it's two characters, you don't necessarily have to say, Nancy said or Judy said. Because your reader will know. Slang is something interesting. I try to stay away from slang. 
because that will um, date your book. If your book is dated in 1947, well, great, then you can use whatever you want because that's history. But I tend not to use slang, and I think that um, gives it a much longer life. When it comes to grammar, uh, oh, I have been, I have been chastised by many a teacher because I listen to kids talk and I know how they talk and it's not always grammatically correct. But I want it to be true to how children talk. Lesson number 11 was about writing dialogue. So she talked about using realistic dialogue for children. Um, children, And she pointed out something that is probably going to be a struggle for me um, in terms of writing for kids. Because I, I am very much a person who likes to, um, not that I don't talk in slang at times, but um, I, I'm so, how do I say this? I am that person who is so grammatically correct about things, or most of the time, like 95, 96% of the time, I find myself correcting myself. I'll say something and I'll hear it back in my ear and I'm like, oh no, that was not grammatically correct. And I'll readjust what I said to, to fix the grammatical errors in what I just said or when I post on social media. Oh, if I post on Facebook and I see that it it was not grammatically correct, I will delete the post, start all over. Um, if I find like a, a image or something to use for an inspirational um, message, I won't post it if I see a grammatical error. If I catch a grammatical error in there, I'm like, oh, nope, can't use that because I guess I just I've always. I was a strange child. I've always talked in full sentences. Um, I went to a private school from the age of five years old until 13. Uh, it wasn't until when I got in high school at 14 that I went to a public school for the very first time and everyone spoke slang and did not speak grammatically correct sentences. And I got made fun of for many, many things in high school. But that was one of them because I talked proper. That that's what they said. So um, and it was just how I talked. And I it, I don't like. I mean, I can use slang now when I talk with friends and things like that. But even sometimes now, it doesn't sound right to my ear. I like speaking in complete full sentences. But children don't speak that way. So that is going to be a an issue for me because she she pointed out when she was talking about she's like children speaking very broken broken sentences and they 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 interrupt each other they talk over each other because that's what kids do and they don't say everything grammatically correct and I'm I'm gonna have to that's gonna be something I'm gonna have to work on and I I know now I'm going to struggle with that but um. Uh, that, that was the gist. She said more, but that, that was the important takeaways that I got from that. Another thing she said about dialogue is to listen to other people and observe them when they talk. So if you're writing for younger people, you listen to a lot of younger people to observe how they talk, what their phrases are. Um, suppose if you're trying to write on trend, you would want to know what they would say today as opposed to writing slang that you remember from 10, 20 years ago. Um, I thought if you're writing futuristic, you can make it up. And she said, make the word choice simple. Kids don't use big, bold words. Well, most kids don't. That was strange. I, I did. So she talked about watching that and making, making things as simple as possible. Because again, you have to hold the child's attention. <laughs> I'll be back next lesson. So the idea of the word plot 
makes me very nervous. Plot. No, I think, no, I can't do plot. Don't ask me questions about plot ever. But I realize that plot is really telling a story. And I tell a story. So maybe the story that I tell is the plot. But if I'm ever asked, you know, about how do I come to do a plot, I, I can't, there's something that, there's something about the word that just intimidates, that makes me so uncomfortable. I start a book on the day something different happens in that character's life. And that journey to get to the end of the book, that journey that the character is taking to get to the end of the book, that must be the plot of the book. But I prefer to think of it as the story that I'm telling. And how do you get from here to here? It's important that the reader really care about the character and be involved with the character before you drop some major something on them so that they, they really care what happens. Get to know the character, get to know the family, the friends, her hopes, her dreams, and then put her in a terrible situation. I like flashbacks. It can, you know, certainly illuminate your characters and um, help you tell the story forward once you know everything that happened. I like backstory. Backstory to me is very interesting. If I'm reading a book and I'm interested in character, I want to know that backstory. That's harder to do maybe in a kid's book because it may be harder for a young reader to go back and forth that way. In terms of using flashbacks, I think fine. And what else I think is fine is write those flashbacks. That's your backstory. And if you don't get to use it, fine. At least you, you know more about your character and that's what counts. Lesson 13 and 14 were Create Plot Structure Part 1 and 2. And the most interesting thing I found in these two lessons, um, well, first she said she doesn't like to, the word plot um, terrifies her. But when she thinks about it, of course, you know, there's plots in her stories. But she doesn't think about it that way. She thinks about it in terms of just storytelling. But most one of the most interesting things that she said um because you know she writes mostly kids books so the way she likes to start every new book sometimes every new chapter um but mostly just new book she likes to start with something new um which i thought was interesting because you know i struggle with beginnings um it's one of my Oh, I loathe beginnings. Um, I don't like endings either because I always struggle with how to end it in a good way. But beginnings are hard because you have to hook the reader. And, and it, you can't just write anything for the beginning. So when she said that, I was like, ooh, okay. I think that that could work, especially for middle grade. Um, because there's always, you know first day of school, first day in a new town, first day, there's a whole lot of first I can work with there. And so she just kind of took some of the intimidation away from me, for, for me, because um, I'm so intimidated about writing middle grade. I'm like, I don't even know where to start. And she just gave me a start. Um, and the whole premise, well, the first book in my middle grade series is going to be her moving to a new town, new school. So why not start on the first day in her new school? Because it's a new thing. And I, I like that 
that idea. I mean, but that works in adult books too. Um, someone starting a new job, getting into a new relationship, um, just starting somewhere, starting somewhere new, traveling somewhere. Get, oops, just thought of it. Never mind. Shiny new idea. <laughs> She also talked about throwing in surprises, um, surprise twists, not, not too many of them, but, and they have to make sense to the story, but surprise twists are always good to move the story along, um, so it doesn't get stagnant, and flashbacks, um, but she did discuss that it's kind of hard to use flashbacks in middle grade, because you don't want to get the, the reader, who is most likely children, to get kind of stuck in am I past or am I in the present where, where am I but um she did say flashbacks is a good way to move the story along uh, with giving it backstory as well so you kind of instead of having to go back and rewrite all of what happened to this person before you could just use flashbacks to give that backstory while staying in the present um, I always like flashbacks, but I always don't know if I'm using them correctly. Um, so sometimes I end up scrapping them because I don't want to use them wrong. <laughs> Next lesson. So my process, it's really fairly simple. <laughs> I think it's in my head and then it transfers down into my notebook and my notebook gives me the security that I need for that first day that I decide to start writing the story and I will never stop making notes in my notebook not until not until it's too late not until the book is in and I know it's set um, so get it all down get down anything don't worry about it that's the whole point you don't have to think oh maybe this isn't working you don't have to think that now you're in a first draft you're just getting everything down that you can get down and then you'll have plenty of time more time than you want to give to it you'll have plenty of time to come back and reassess and see what there is and see what you can make happen. I'm a person who has to print out all the time. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm using a lot of paper. I try to use both sides. I print out every day and everything that I write all around it and over it and under it that's very, very important for the next day. My most creative moments come with a pencil in my hand. There's something that connects, you know, the brain and the hand. And I don't know where those ideas come from, but they seem to come with a pencil. In a second draft, um, not so much trying to solve the problems of the plot or the storytelling, uh, I'm probably trying to go deeper into who are these characters. And, and by finding out about them, that's going to help me tell their story and move forward. And I'll hope that when I read through a second draft, there will be little bits that delight me along the way. I think an old fashioned work ethic is really essential. Writing is your job, if it is your job. Writing is my job. And so that's the only way I can get it done. If you want to write, if you're serious about writing, maybe you're already writing, um, you have to do this. You have to make the time. I know we all have heard of people who get up at five in the morning and they do their writing for the first two hours and they get things done. I could never do that. I'm a morning person, but not that early a morning person. It's not 
just that you sit down to write. I mean, I think you need to, you need to let this out. It may be a fun idea to think, oh, I'm going to be a writer, but the reality of it is, it's not that much fun. <laughs> it's fun when you have a book on the shelf that you wrote and say, oh, I wrote that book, how did I do that? That's fun. But the writing itself is not fun. It's, it's hard and, and you have to keep at it. can't go out there today without an agent. It's completely different than it was when I started. Um, you know, my first three books were unagented books because writers were still being, um, they were still being discovered in the slush pile, which meant that, you know, manuscripts were just coming in and somebody was reading them. Uh, but that doesn't happen today. The, editors don't want to see a manuscript, as far as I know, that doesn't come through an agent. So your first job is to get that agent's attention and make that agent want to find out more about you. I asked my agent this question about how does a new writer find an agent today? And she said, you have to write an incredible one page query that's just a knockout that just captures this person's attention. So like everything else, take your time, you know, make sure, make sure that it's a good letter. I always, always listen. And I, in most cases, always give it a try, what they're saying, because why not? I give it a try. And if it's wrong, it won't come to me. It won't come when I'm trying to revise along that line. It just won't work. And then I know it's wrong. And I can say, this isn't working for me. This isn't right for me. Sometimes by figuring out what's not right, again, you'll figure out what is right. There's nothing that any of us write that can't be made better or tighter or leaner or whatever. But so there's always room and I would always listen. And when you're known as somebody who's open and willing, I think that makes a big difference to your career as a writer. Rejection is a fact of life if you want to be a writer. Um, it's never easy, it's painful, uh, but you know, I think determination is every bit as important as talent. You can have all the talent in the world, and if you can't take it, the rejection, negative reviews, you're just not going to do it. You're going to stop. If you're scared to be rejected, well, you're never going to find out if you've got it and you can be published. So put that out the window. So you have to get over the fear of being rejected. And there is a lot of fear of being rejected. It hurts. So practice, you know, accumulate the, the rejection letters and it'll get easier. It will. Imagination has always been such a part of my life. I mean, every kid imagines. Nobody can have too much imagination, let alone a writer. There's no writer 
who has too much imagination. The best thing for you to do right now is to start writing or get back to what you were writing. Um, don't think about it too much. Don't overanalyze it. Just let it happen. Just sit down, start doing it, and good luck. So there you have it. There is my Judy Bloom Masterclass experience. So I wanted to explain why I didn't, like on my damn round Masterclass video, I know I did it an assessment after every single class so the reason I didn't do one do it like that on this one was because so I love Judy Bloom I want to preface it this by saying I love Judy Bloom I loved her books as a kid um I just didn't I didn't get as much out of this master class experience as I did at the Dan Brown one I felt it was more she was how do I put this um I mean, obviously, they're sharing their experiences and what they learned from them, but I, I guess I expected or wanted a more instructional tone, and there were bits and pieces of instruction in there about writing for younger readers, but I guess I was just expecting it to be a little more. Um, uh, I'm not, it's not saying I didn't get a lot out. I just didn't, I um, only took eight and a half pages of notes. I think with Dan Brown, I took like 15 pages of notes. Um, so, I, I, you know, I got something out of it. It's just, I didn't, every single one wasn't something that I took a lot from. So, um, I gave you assessments of the ones that I got the most out of. And, um... I mean, I definitely will take a lot of what she said into my attempt to write middle grade. I say attempt because I don't really know if I can do it until I try. So I think I can, but writing for kids is not for everyone. And um, I guess I'll find out if it's for me or not. But I did get a spark of a, um, quite a few sparks of ideas for my book, for my series while watching her master class so there were tons of information but it felt more i guess the best way to say it it didn't feel like i was in a class it felt like more like she was giving an interview there's a difference between watching someone or hearing someone give an interview and being in class with someone and um i, I did feel it, like it was more of me watching her being interviewed as opposed to me gaining instruction from her or getting you know being in a class setting type of thing like Dan Brown I felt like I was in class like he was really schooling me <laughs> and um but I don't I don't want to make that sound like there's nothing to take from this class because I mean it's it's Judy Bloom of course there's something to take from this class I just didn't get as much out of it as I was expecting to um some of the things that I didn't include in in the video clips were when she was talking about um well no I did clue when she talked about working with editors um marketplace when she got to talking about the con controversy and censorship and her books some sometimes wanting people wanting to censor her books because they talked about you know real issues that people didn't think kids should be talking about like girls getting their periods or girls even thinking about sex or girls wondering about their body and you know which is just silly it's just silly but she talked about that not being not letting it bother you or get to you being brave enough to to fight against the critics and the censors people that want to censor your work and you know just understanding that that's just a part of Part of the the industry in the writing business some people are going to want to censor what you write but you should never be afraid to write what's honest for you just because you don't want to be censored so i just wanted to touch on that since i, I did not include that in the clip she talked about her career journey and you know different stages or that she was in in life as it pertained to different books that she wrote 
So I, I just, that's something that I hope that you get a masterclass and you will discover on your own and venture out on your own and journey to hear more about Judy Bloom. And I did find out a lot about her that I, I didn't know. And um, which gives me insight into how she could write for kids in such a prolific way that she did because I, I, my favorite and I loved fudge and super fudge and you know freckle juice and all you know I love those books my favorite book of hers are you there God it's me Margaret that is my favorite Judy Bloom book um probably the funniest one is fudge but yeah so um that is my takeaway from Judy Bloom's class. It it is a good class, so I don't want to make my my slight cons seem like a reason for you not to take this class because it's it's a good class. Uh, her workbook though is um, probably more intense than her actual master class, so. Definitely, if you take her masterclass, definitely download the workbook. Don't forget. I almost did. <laughs> but, yes. That is going to be it for this video. If you like what you see and you want to see more videos from me, make sure that you hit the like and subscribe button. And let me know in the comments, what masterclass would you like me to entertain taking in the future? I'm curious. I will tell you that my next one is Joyce Carol Oates. But after that, I'm open for comments. I mean, I have a list, but if you have any preferred ones you'd like to see me take, let me know in the comments. Till next time, have a blessed day. Bye.